Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. We've got a really impressive set of speakers here today joining us for this webinar on the important topic of African data centers and cloud infrastructure. This one is the sixth in a series of Africa CEO Forum webinars on digital transformation. This is a really important topic for all of us here today. Data centers and cloud infrastructure are key enablers for Africa's digital economy. Africa has more internet users than America and demand is soaring. But at the same time, there are big challenges to growth. And despite having 17% of the world's population, Africa has less than 1% of total data center capacity. And in the next 75 minutes, with our excellent and diverse panel today, we'll be addressing questions such as, how do we break down the barriers to growing critical data center and cloud infrastructure in Africa? What can governments do to ensure data independence and sovereignty? And taking all of this together, what does that mean for Africa's digital transformation and what different players can do in the space to build the cloud and data center ecosystem? My name is Annette Chow. I'm your moder moderator today. I'm an associate partner at Dahlberg focused on technology and data-driven inclusive business models. Before we start in earnest, just a few points of housekeeping. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen in Zoom, a Q&A button where you can ask speaker questions. And please keep these coming over the webinar. We may not have time to answer all of them, but we'll come to them towards the end of the session. A poll will also be launched during the conference. So, so it'll be an interactive conversation. And what we'll um, do in that is to do that um, before and after the our guest speaker um, comes in towards the middle of the session. Please also follow along on Twitter if you're on it with hashtag ACF digital events. That's hashtag ACF digital events. And just a heads up as well that at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button for interpretation as most of the webinar will be in English and some of it will be in French. So please um, choose the language you'd like and you can go from there. Just a reminder as well that there will be the annual summit of the Africa CEO Forum in Abidjan on the 13th and 14th of June this year, which will be an exciting chance to reconnect. And you can see a link for registration coming up in the chat just now. So I'd like to introduce the great panel who have made time to join us today for an interesting discussion. So first of all, we have Roger Felix Adam, the Minister of Digital Economy, Telecommunications and Innovation in the Ivory Coast. And Minister Adam has deep experience in ICT and telecommunications. In past life, in past lives, taken technology focused roles at Capgemini, Orange, the AFDB, Vivendi and more. We have Patrice Tano, the group COO at DataBridge West Africa, who has deep experience in rolling out and operating data centers and is a board member for the Africa Data Center Association. We have Mono Susi, the vice president of cloud and AI for Huawei Northern Africa, building Huawei's North and West Africa cloud business and helping governments in the region build sovereign clouds. We have Funke Opeke, the founder and CEO of Main One, a broadband infrastructure company in West Africa. She's an electrical engineer and entrepreneur taking an innovative approach that we'll hear more about throughout this webinar. We have Ismail Balkayat, a serial entrepreneur who is co-founder and CEO at Shari, a Morocco-based e-commerce and fintech app for retailers in French-speaking Africa. And we have our expert who I'll be handing over to shortly, Paul-François Cartier, the Managing Director of the Africa Data Centers Association. With a background in data center infrastructure and strategy in Africa, before founding the Africa Data Centers Association, he was Schneider Electric's President of French-speaking Africa and Islands, covering over 60 countries and pushing forward their data center strategy. Paul-François, looking forward to hearing from you, and I'll hand over to you for an initial presentation before we start the panel discussion. 
Thank you, Annette. Um, so I'm Paul François Cattier, I'm Managing Director of Africa Data Center Association. And I'm here, I'm here to set up the scene for the, the webinar. Uh, representing Africa Data Center Association and his uh, chairman, uh, Dr. Ayotunde Coker uh, from Nigeria, who is also the CEO of uh, Rack Center. So as a quick uh, reminder, next slide, please. Uh, data Center is a farm of servers and connectivity with all electrical and cooling equipment to make it reliable. Uh, every time you click on your smartphone, uh, your request or your click goes through multiple data centers to perform digital services. A data center needs land, electricity, and water. In the last 10 years, data centers have moved from being privately owned by enterprise or government to host their IT equipment towards a market dominated by co-location company and cloud services uh, uh, company data center. So co-location is a data center, the building uh, with all the secure environment for uh, electricity and cooling that is renting some space to host uh, uh, the IT equipment of their customer. And cloud services data center uh, uh, are exactly the same, but in addition, you have the servers, they have servers, and in fact, they are renting time of the service of the server uh, with the paper use approach for their customer uh, uh, enterprise or government. So in Africa, you have around 80 private data center operators that are operating a data center as a business offering either colocation services or cloud services or both to their customer. And these 80 private data center operators are operating around 100 data centers in Africa. In the chart on the right, you see in green the existing data center for a, a, a list of countries. And you see that the main country today is South Africa. But in blue, you have the planned activity, uh, the, the, the data centers that are planned to be built in the coming uh, months. And you see that uh, Nigeria is a very active country. And we have a, a representative from Nigeria here uh, with uh, Funke. Uh, 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 but most of the country are also a lot of plan activity. And what you see as well is, uh, despite the fact that usually French speaking uh, country are smaller in population, in terms of populations than the English speaking country, you, are, you start to have a lot of planned activity for French speaking country. Next slide, please, uh, Sophia. So uh, uh, last year, uh, Africa Data Center uh, Association, together with Xalam Analytics, which is a consulting firm in New York, uh, specialized in Africa and data center uh, industry, uh, conduct a, a study to understand what would be the need uh, in terms of data center for Africa to support it, its digital economy by 2030. And we did the benchmark with uh, India, uh, which is uh, very comparable to Africa in terms of population, GDP, and maturity uh, in terms of data center. We did also the benchmark with South Africa, who is the champion today of Africa in terms of data center. And we did the benchmark also with Netherlands, which is by far the highest uh, density of data center per population and per GDP uh, in the world. Uh, and and uh, population and GDP are the main driver of uh, the development of data center. So uh, the result of the study was that we need uh, to build 700 new data centers of three megawatts each to support uh, the digi African digital economy by 2030. This is a $25 billion investment spread across 54 countries. And there is some big needs, uh, typically for a reliable electricity from the grid or to find some mitigation with on-site generation, microgrid, and renewable technology. There is also a big need about connectivity, uh, and specifically to non-coastal country. And there is the need for land, but not land everywhere, mostly land in business district. Next slide, please. 
So what is important? Why it's important to have data center in Africa? First, the main argument is about data sovereignty. Data uh, uh, are the whole of the 21st century. So they are the data of government, the data of private company, the data of citizen, and these data need to be protected. And if they want to be correctly protected, they need to be protected under the local law. So this is very important uh, to have uh, the data under the local law. And for this, this data has to be computed and stored locally. Also, the data sovereignty is very important for the business continuity of an entire country. Today, the digital economy represents 15% of the global GDP. Uh, maybe it's so 15%, just to make you an, an idea, it's the size of China economy, GDP. So uh, if today, Africa has maybe only 6% of its economy that is digital. By 2030, it will be in the 30%. So if you want to protect, be sure that you have a business continuity for 30% of your economy in your country, you need to have uh, the, the data compute and store locally in your country. You cannot depend of another country, of a foreign country, and even uh, more not depend on a, on a country that is not on Africa to support your digital economy. The third, the second argument is really about performance. The performance, data center performance, depends on latency time. And to be performant, you need to be below 30 milliseconds reach of each closer data center of where you are. And this means less than 1,000 kilometers after it starts to be much less performing. And this is very important for the company, for the government, but also for the startup. And startup need this performance, but, but they need also to develop a fruitful ecosystem, and they can do it when they are hosted in the same data center. By experience, in Europe, in US, in China, in Southeast Asia, the, the startup that are hosted in the same DC share a fruitful ecosystem that allows them to bring uh, better services to their user. So data must be computed and stored locally in Africa. And the physical infrastructure, the data center physical infrastructure uh, uh, could be owned or financed by non-African. But this physical infrastructure need to be built locally in Africa for data sovereignty, for performance, and for the startup. As you can see, Africa is very dynamic, six times more than the global average in startup uh, development, and they need to have a performant infrastructure. Next slide, please. So what are the main hurdles to tackle? First, I would say that data center is uh, are a very attractive object for investors. Uh, uh, there is two things, uh, and typically African data centers are very attractive for investors. One, the data center itself is a very profitable object. And second, you have growth. And when you bring profitability and growth to international investors, you are exactly in their dream. So this is very attractive for investors, but there is some downside for Africa. The first downside is the reliability and quality of electricity in Africa. To build a digital economy, you need electricity and you need to have this electricity reliable and with a good quality. The second necessity is to have a reliable and competitive connectivity. And if you look at the chart on the right, uh, uh, you, the best in class in country in Africa is Egypt with 15 subsea cables. But you have to understand that in most of the collocation uh, uh, data center in mature market, you can have several designs of fiber connectivity, fiber connection to different carriers, different networks, and so on, to ensure uh, the reliability and the connectivity. And if you make the count of the country, you have only 37 countries who have subsea cables arriving, 17 countries that are not coastal country doesn't have any landing cable. So, we need to build this regional integration 
of uh, connectivity to ensure that every country, even the non-coastal country in Africa, can access uh, to this connectivity. The, the other orders are really uh, the international investors. They are not looking at it to invest in one data center in one country. They want to build a network of data center. And most of the players in Africa have a pan-African strategy. They want to develop several data centers in several countries. And here you have some difficulty uh, of financing uh, regarding 54 country different rules to have uh, tax on capital transfer using the profit of a data center in a country to develop a data center in another country. You have difficulty in the regulations that are different for 54 countries. So really what we need is to develop an FTCA for the digital economy. Thank you for, it, for your attention. If you want to participate to Africa Data Center Association and become a member as a Menwan, as a West Africa Data Bridge, don't hesitate, or Huawei, don't hesitate uh, to send me a mail. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul Francois. Very clear message from that. Investing in data center infrastructure is important and necessary with the numbers that Paul Francois was showing around a need for 700 new data centers of three megawatts each by 2030. And at the same time, we see major challenges from a sector that can be capital intensive and power hungry. So Patrice, I'd like to turn um, to you with an initial question. From the perspective of someone who operates several data centers in West Africa, can you tell us more about the difficulties you've encountered in terms of some of the things that Paul Francois was mentioning in terms of access to electricity and the negative impact this has had in terms of the ability for data centers to provide uninterrupted provision? Patrice, I think you might be on mute, so I can't hear you just yet. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Good. Thank you, uh, Paul Francois, for the introduction. Thank you, Annette. Um, as a data center operation, uh, operator, we, I mean, we we are facing, uh, of course, uh, some 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 challenging. We are in Africa. Uh, Paul Francois just mentioned um, uh, some of the challenge that is uh, the electricity, and. Uh, from our experience, uh, West Africa uh, Data Bridge, uh, we are, I mean, career neutral uh, data center service provider. And uh, the challenge that we, we were facing uh, in the operation of our first facility was, of course, the power. Okay. And um, one of the main challenge is that we, we have, uh, from our strategy, we located a, 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 a site that was in the midst of the, of the city. But the challenge is that the power was not, um, I mean, available. The, the capacity that we needed was not available. Um, why? Because, um, you know, uh, we don't produce much power uh, as uh, we, we need to develop uh, our business. So we, we have to, uh, unfortunately, load down the, the, our requirements in terms of power because of this. And uh, if you have to, to get exactly what you need, then you need to pay a lot um, more than what you, you, you expected. So this is one of the, the challenging, but uh, personally in our location, we, 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 in terms of stability, I mean, we, we have a power that is, I mean, a power grid, a national power grid that is more stable than other areas, but still uh, it's, it's still a challenge. Uh, that's why we are thinking about um, other solution like uh, renewable uh, energy so this is uh, something that uh, this is something that uh, every uh, data center uh, actor has to you know um, tap into and to, to be able to to set uh, sustainability yeah so this is what i can tell you concerning i mean uh, the the energy challenge that's the one of the most uh, challenge the second one probably that i can talk about is the land yeah, is the land. You know, um, we, we all know that depending on the size of data center that we, know, we need to build for, for us, for instance, um, 
before we, we go for, I mean, any sites, we, we have several, um, uh, several factors that we, we need to, to look at uh, so that you make sure that, uh, I mean, we will not make any mistake in selecting the, 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 the location or the land for our development. So we need to look at the size, of course, and the suitability of the outland. But the location uh, becoming a challenge when you, are, you want to get close to the city, of course, you'll get something um, uh, that is difficult to afford, OK? And unfortunately, when you have to go uh, far from the city, then you have the challenge of the availability of some of the, I mean, connectivity uh, 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 resources and even the power resources will not be available. So this is what I can uh, tell you uh, about the challenge that we are facing. Thank you so much, Patrice. Really interesting on some of the challenges that you're facing. And I'd like to um, shift to talking about another challenge, which is that a lot of the data content in Africa is driven through France. So in Maasai, for example, rather than being stored on the continent and that that distance is really enough to be disruptive for some types of services, particularly for operators who need to offer premium data transfer speeds to their customers. And Funke, I'd love to turn to you on this because your company, Main One, is innovative in the space of working locally, developing creative approaches to source reliable power, minimize downtime, and really deliver a quality service through a local workforce. So I'd be keen to understand from you, can you tell us more about how you have looked at these challenges and have been able to build up a local workforce delivering these world-class technologies? Um, thank you, Annette, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, the specific focus and the vision of Main One is to bridge the digital divide in Africa, and clearly the infrastructure gaps that we face in the digital space are consistent with what we see in other key infrastructure sectors of the continent. But this being the digital age and needing to have this kind of technology we set out first um, at the company's inception to build a submarine cable and subsequently uh, moved into building data centers because we recognize that not only did we need to connect other parts of the world we also needed to provide the data and bring the data closer to consumers in West Africa, as Paul Francois said, and also give our local businesses and startups the um, platform um, to host their data locally and be connected into global networks and distribute on a global scale. Uh, the, the challenge um, for Africa truly, um, where you have issues of experience, you also have a very large youth population um, that is being educated um, in Africa and globally and are able to step into this role. So we have um, grown our workforce. Um, of course, I had worked professionally um, in the United States and attended graduate school before I came back to Nigeria. And you have similar individuals with global experience able to assist. But most of our workforce is Nigerian, um, or Ghanaian or Ivorian um, born, bred, trained university education. And then in this digital age, a lot of information is available from our global partners um, to train and upscale our talent and to be supported by our partners to deliver this innovative technologies in Africa. So that's how we have focused on it, um, growing our own, training our own and um, creating that workforce um, that has enabled our business to grow and thrive. Thank you, Funke. Yeah, it's such an inspiring example of a business able to look at these challenges and thrive in the sector. And some of these challenges, such as power sourcing, connectivity, have really affected African companies. And there are some users who see Microsoft or Amazon international providers as potentially more reliable. Ismail, I'd like to turn to you next as the co-founder and CEO of a successful, of a successful e-commerce startup 
that does use data centers heavily, of course. So I'd like to ask you um, about where you decided to host your data and why that is, and what must African data center providers do to face up to this international competition? Ismail, I think you might be on mute. Yeah, sorry for that. Okay, no hello, worries. Annette. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the question, and thank you also, Paul Francois, for the great introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm going to give my answer as, as a startup. And Paul Francois already mentioned a few challenges that people may have when it comes to hosting the data. He spoke about performance, reliability, and data sovereignty. I would like to give more details and maybe add two other challenges for startups. So data sovereignty, as you may know, as a startup, of course, we would have preferred to have the data in our own country, but that's not such a big issue for us. Um, we look more into performance as we need our data to be always ready and uh, quick to be uh, released. Uh, when it comes to reliability, of course, uh, we speak only with the 5.9, which is your data always available, 99.999 of the time. Um, without that, you can't run the business, especially when you have a lot of clients who need your service. No, I would, I would like to add two more points. The first point is, um, security. Uh, again, uh, when you are a startup, you need to make sure that your data is not placed in one single point. It has to be duplicated in various geographies. So in case there is anything that may happen, let's say an earthquake uh, or a burn, at least you have a backup. We've seen what happened in France recently with the servers with, of OVH and many big companies got their data done for a, a, a long time, and some of them lost them. Uh, we also need to make sure that potential hackers won't get into our data. So we need to make sure that the people behind the, the, the handling of the servers know who put in place, how to put in place the right security um, bridges. Anyway, um, that being said, let's move to what is important as an entrepreneur uh, when it comes to, to hosting your data. There is something called, that we didn't speak about, but there is something called pricing. Um, nowadays, we use the servers on a pay-as-you-go basis, which means that we rent, we, we rent the, the, the computers based on the uh, use of it. So when we need a large amount of computing, we will rent it for the day and can go up and down with the power of, of uh, the computers behind. So your invoices can go really high uh, if you have a lot of usage. Uh, and as you know, when you are a startup at the beginning, you don't necessarily have all the financial means to, to, to finance such kind of investments. And as a startup, you get from Amazon, from Google, from, um, again, uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, a lot of free usage of their service, not only for the hosting, but also for the uh, support. So whenever you are accepted in an accelerator within in Africa or outside Africa, let's take our example. We got accelerated by plug and play in Morocco. Once inside plug and play, Amazon came to us and said, hey guys, why don't you take $20,000 of service for free just so you can start? Then we moved to Paris in Station F. Amazon came again and gave us $50,000. Microsoft also offered uh, some service for free on Azure and some support. And then we got into Y Combinator. Google came to us, gave us a lot of perks. So at the end of the day, we ended up with hundreds of thousands of dollars of servers and support for free. So again, we would love to use services in Africa, 
But when you are, when you have for free other service outside the continent with the support that goes with and with the security, obviously you will end up choosing to have your data outside the continent. Great, thank you so much, Ismail. Really interesting experiences there. So I'll um, turn to Munir next, and Minister Adam, I'll turn to you after that for our guest interview. And one theme we've been talking about has been data centers being power hungry and taking energy, and also being an industry seeing really impressive growth. Clearly more data centers will drive more energy usage and more CO2 em emissions. So energy efficiency is a really critical theme here, both for cost and environmental reasons. So Munir, I'd like to ask you to draw from your work on the ground, building and operating data centers. What do you see as the biggest trends and the best practices to learn from in this space? And in particular, can you tell us more about Huawei's work to help plan, construct and manage the new generation of green data centers? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Annette, for hosting me. And uh, thank you, uh, Francois, for, uh, for uh, the introduction presentation. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, uh, before I, I, I answer your question, Annette, just uh, uh, let me uh, tell you who we are uh, as Hawaii in Africa. Uh, we operate in Africa for almost uh, 25 years. Uh, we connect uh, African citizens to, uh, to Africa between them, but we also connect African to the world. So uh, almost a third of the population use directly and indirectly uh, our services, products, uh, and, uh, and solution. And we know Africa, we know Africa very, very well. We have been deploying solutions uh, in very challenging environment, uh, you know, in, uh, in the villages, in the cities, in the mountains, and you can imagine the number of sites uh, with the, the energy challenges we are facing and we learn from this. So the energy and the efficiency of usage of energy that is as, uh, as Francois uh, stated in the uh, introduction uh, presentation, it is really the electricity, the quality of the energy is a real challenge for uh, digital Africa uh, uh, moving forward. So we learned from this uh, uh, two decades of deploying uh, our solution, the sites, uh, our networks, our transmission, our radio, the challenge from, uh, from, from uh, uh, managing and operating the energy efficiently. And uh, we created last, uh, last year a dedicated business unit, uh, Digital Power, uh, within Hawaii uh, that will make uh, the usage uh, uh, of electricity, of the energy uh, more greener, uh, smarter, and uh, efficient, okay? And this is what uh, we have the mission uh, to do. Now, going back to our data center discussion and where, uh, uh, what are the trends, uh, as I mentioned, we created this business unit, Digital Power, and we are launching a new complete product, for example, 100% green energy, solar powered 100 megawatt uh, 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 data center that has been launched recently, a few weeks ago in the Middle East, in, uh, in UAE uh, with the uh, Morohab. Uh, this has been a first and 100% uh, uh, and uh, solar uh, powered data center uh, and the biggest and largest in in Middle East and Africa and those are the new innovations that we are we are we are launching to to the market okay so this is one of the new trends we are seeing in the green uh, energy and Africa for example has the potential has the resources uh, and especially the natural resources to bring electricity and energy more greener than, than ever. But we have to, as I mentioned, to be smarter in the usage of this energy and build 
around it to use it. Solar, for example, in Africa is available every day of the year. So how uh, can government invest into that and build data center green solar powered energy in uh, the, the, the new data center deployed, okay? This is one, one dimension. Another dimension, uh, construction, building data center, we are seeing it's not efficacious, uh, uh, efficient, okay? It's time consuming. We are now launching a new trend that we created a few years back on prefabricated data center. Prefabricated data center where AI is used, how we use uh, anti, uh, uh, artificial intelligence into the data center to better consume the energy and, and, and be smarter in the usage. So the prefabricated trend is also growing uh, in the coming years. And from time to market, from energy consumption and effic efficiency, we are seeing uh, a better trend and better TCO on this new generation of, of, of uh, 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 data center, okay? That will bring the power usage effic uh, effectiveness, the PUE, uh, uh, which is an indicator of how a data center use the energy and the electricity in the data center. So normal standard in the world of the PUE is uh, uh, below 1.5, okay? Uh, if you operate around 1.3, which is one of the best in class, up to 1.5, you are using your electricity at, at, at good usage. We broke uh, uh, last year, two years back, 2020, the world record, uh, record on PUE in one of our deployment at 1.1 uh, PUE. And this is because we don't only use uh, the heating and the energy, but we use also uh, integrated in our uh, modular data center or prefabricated data center, uh, artificial intelligence to better consume and predict the consumption uh, uh, cycles and waves uh, before it happens. And this will help uh, the better usage. So at the end, all of those trends will make uh, 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 efficiency and smartness in the electricity and energy uh, uh, consumption in the data center world. And this is happening uh, at bigger scale. Today, uh, if I share some statistics with you, uh, data center worldwide use uh, uh, around uh, less than 2%, one something uh, percent of the, uh, the worldwide electricity consumption, so the data center. But we are seeing the data center doubling and tripling this percentage. So the coming 10 years or coming decade, we will see the percentage of users of data center electricity growing tremendously. And we cannot continue uh, having a linear consumption while this huge growth. So uh, artificial intelligence, smartness, efficiently, a green, uh, energy needs to be involved in the decision uh, of choosing the data center. I hope that I answered with some example your question, Anne. Thank you, Munir. Really interesting examples of innovation in the space. Thank you. Now we'll just shortly go to a quick poll um, for our attendees um, to fill out before we go to Minister Adam. Great, so hopefully you'll see um, a poll coming up on your screen on the most urgent priority to increase data center capacity in Africa. So please do go ahead and vote on that. And we'll now turn to Minister Adam. Just as a reminder, um, there's an interpretation button at the bottom of your screen, should you wish to choose for audio in English and or French. So okay. just as a re... Great, thank you. Just as a recap, Minister Adam um, is the Minister of Digital Economy, Telecommunications and Innovation in the Ivory Coast. And it's really great to have you here with us. Okay, thank you very much. I have not the, the screen at, because, you, you, okay, it's okay now. Okay, it's okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm going to switch in, uh, in French. 
Okay. Absolutely. And apologies from my side as well for my own. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. No, no worries. Great to connect. No worries. No worries. Great. So interesting um, conversation so far. And I'd like to turn to you to talk to your experience in government as well as your really deep background in telecoms and IT. And I know that last July, you inaugurated a new shared backup data center in Yamasukro. And I'd like to ask what kinds of functions does that backup center perform and why was it constructed? Merci. Désolé, hein. sorry to, to switch in French, but it's better for me to, 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 to answer in French. Um, ce que je pourrais dire, c'est que à Yamsukro, nous avons mis en place oh. un data center. We have implemented a shared backup data center in order to get all the different finance. Nous avons mis en place à, 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 à Yamsukro. Um, et c'est donc un donné. Donc, ch chacune des institutions financières a déjà un, back, un, un data center primaire, là où elle se trouve. Et nous avons mis donc, un data center mutualisé de sécurité, des données de backup à Yamsukro. Un, ça nous permettait d'être en dehors d'Abidjan en cas de difficulté. Et puis de deux, c'est d'avoir toutes ces données stockées à un seul endroit et de pouvoir justement les retravailler derrière. Donc voilà, en, en tout cas, ce que je dis. Donc, c'était vraiment la partie sécurité qui était pour nous réellement le, le plus important pour être sûr que, euh, en cas de sinistre, en cas de désastre, nous puissions récupérer ces données rapidement. It's okay, you, you remit, it's okay? Yeah. Yes, perfect, thank you. So interesting themes around security and continuity. And Paul Francois earlier as well talked today about the importance of data sovereignty. Yeah. And some African countries, um, as we know, have put in place laws looking at local hosting of data, especially for public data or data from sensitive sectors. So yeah. what I'd like to ask you, Minister Adam, is what the Ivorian state is doing in terms of digital independence. Oui, mais en tout cas, j'ai écouté les débats qui étaient très intéressants, notamment sur les startups qui, ont regard, qui regardent le coup. C'est normal. Nous, en tant qu'État, en tant que gouvernement, nous sommes obligés à avoir les données stockées dans le pays, puisque en cas de difficulté, euh, il est important que nos données soient disponibles. Donc, le, de, 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 de le pays, donc, plusieurs institutions, et notamment au niveau gouvernemental, nous réfléchissons à avoir un data center de l'administration dans lequel toutes les données seront mutualisées. Au-delà de ça, nous avons différentes lois qui ont été prises depuis 2013 qui imposent que les données soient hébergées en Côte d'Ivoire. Donc, en tant qu'État, nous, nous avons l'obligation d'avoir cette souveraineté de nos données, mais nous, nous aussi, nous, nous imposons à toutes les institutions, qu'elles soient privées ou publiques, œuvrant en Côte d'Ivoire, avoir les données stockées, enfin, au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire, soit dans l'espace de la CDAO. Et c'est une obligation légale parce qu'il est impératif que ces données soient disponibles et qu'on puisse les travailler, les vérifier à tout, à tout moment. Thank you, Minister Adam. And what other measures is your government implementing to promote the creation of new private data centers? Oui, c'est vrai que ce qu'il faut voir en, en Côte d'Ivoire, comme disait Menouane, nous avons quatre data centers dont le dernier, le dernier est celui qui a été implémenté par Menouane en fin 2019, début 2020. Nous avons quand même quatre, quatre caps sous-marins. Ensuite, nous avons beaucoup d'opérateurs privés, dont je ne citerai pas le nom ici pour des raisons de publicité, qui ont déjà des data centers privés. Nous avons aussi une zone franche que nous appelons le VTIB, dans laquelle nous permettons à des opérateurs privés de venir s'installer en Côte d'Ivoire pour mettre en place des data centers et puis justement pour pouvoir avoir, avoir des, des, des exemptions fiscales et puis au niveau des impôts, pour justement favoriser l'implémentation de toutes ces, ces entreprises dans notre pays. Notre ambition est réellement de devenir un hub technologique et d'être le hub digital de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, afin que chacun puisse venir en Côte d'Ivoire investir et permettre les données, et surtout que notre savoir-faire et notre connaissance technologique puisse réellement être connue et issu de tous. Donc vraiment, euh, l'ambition, c'est vrai que j'ai écouté tout à l'heure au niveau des startups, la volonté de se dire, je vais plutôt les mettre en dehors de l'Afrique 
parce qu'en Afrique, euh, c'est des fois trop cher. J'ai écouté aussi ce que disait Mounir en disant qu'en en Afrique, il y a de l'énergie, qu'elle soit solaire ou pas solaire. En tout cas, en, en Côte d'Ivoire, nous avons la capacité en termes de connectivité, nous avons la capacité énergétique, et maintenant derrière, il nous faut donc avoir le savoir-faire pour faire en sorte que nous puissions avoir nos propres data centers. Et on, comme j'ai vu dans l'introduction, que l'Afrique possède aujourd'hui moins de 1% des data, data centers dans le monde. Et c'est vrai, c'est normal parce que nous manque la compétence technique. Nous well, la... true. We lack the know-how, the technical knowledge. Le temps de rattraper le gap et de faire en sorte que, que toutes les entreprises basées en Afrique avoir la capacité justement de pouvoir stocker leurs données en Afrique. Et pour nous, c'est important en termes de souveraineté. Et comme l'Europe ou l'Amérique veulent avoir leurs données stockées dans leur pays, dans leur continent, nous aussi, nous voulons avoir nos données stockées chez nous, dans notre continent. Thank you so much, Minister Adam, for being here with Thank us you. today. It's been really interesting to hear about your work building the digital Thank you economy very much. Thank you. and the digital transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, it's great to see lots of folks as well connecting in the chat. So please keep doing that. And please keep, feel free to keep sharing your questions in the Q&A, um, where there's a button for Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Great. So as we Interesting um, to hear reactions um, to what Minister Adam shared, and we'll move on shortly to um, thinking about data sovereignty and some of the issues that raises. Just before that, reflecting on what was shared by our expert earlier around the scale and growth of this market, it's one where the African data centers market was at already 2 billion in 2020 and is expected to reach 5 billion by 2026, according to the Africa Data Centers Association. Clearly, it's an attractive market for investors, as Paul Francois was saying earlier, and there's still progress to make. Funke, I'd like to briefly turn to you to ask about your experience here, because clearly you've got great investment looking at, invest, looking at um, DCs in West Africa. And I'd like to ask how you're funding growth currently and can you talk to us about how we can attract more investors on the continent? Um, thank you, Annette. Um, in terms of investment, clearly the growth opportunities, when you look at the population of Africa, as you mentioned, the proportion of data centers that we have um, relative to the global footprint um, and the population clearly um, increased digital adoption on the continent, there is room for growth. And we are seeing that. When we started in 2010, main one, uh, building the first private submarine cable on the West Coast of Africa, internet penetration was about 10% across the region, um, accessed primarily through satellite and the existing um, publicly owned submarine cable system. Since then, we have witnessed considerable growth in connectivity and this increased access, which has driven internet populations and broadband access across most of the region to approximately 40%, um, is driving the growth of data centers. Um, the, obviously, once you get on the internet, you are accessing information, both local, but as was mentioned earlier, we have all the global giants and the global content providers, um, which African consumers um, also have the privilege and the opportunity of using the tools. And so once Africans get online, um, they have this global access that the internet provides. Well, it's not lost on those global players that there is a market in Africa. And as we've had more Africans come online, we have seen interest in investment in Africa, be it in creating applications um, specific to the needs of the African market. I think Ishmael talked about that and all the freebies they're getting from the global players to encourage their growth on their platforms. And also the global platforms are also and the global giants and financiers are looking to invest in Africa to support 
uh, that growth and the expansion of the market, they are also commercial enterprises, so the business for themselves. So I would say overall, um, the growth in consumption of applications, the growth in consumption of data, the growth in terms of the user population, and the future prospect that Africa still has the largest un underserved um, and yet to be connected population globally um, and the growth, economic growth that's projected for the future of Africa, the population growth, the youth population. I think all those economic indices are what's driving the growth. It, where's investment coming from? I would say the investment is still largely international investment. When we started in 2010, we raised almost all of our money, um, 240 million at that time. We raised about 90% of that from African investors led by the African Development Bank. I think today um, the situation is changing and you have more international players and international money interested in the continent. Um, as you may know, uh, we, main one is currently um, in the process of being acquired by the number one digital um, infrastructure company globally to become part of that global platform. And so you're, you're starting to see, and this is only one of several transactions that have been announced in the past six months of global players starting to take a position in the Africa digital infrastructure market. So I would say that's where the capital is coming from. I would, for businesses that are able to compete, that are able to um, build a business model or deploy infrastructure consistent with world-class standards, I would say uh, this is an attractive market in terms of investment. Thank you, Funko. Really interesting. And yeah, interesting themes around international and local and thinking about this in the context of this really fast growing market. We heard from Minister Adam earlier about the key role of governments in the data center ecosystem and Africa's digital transformation more broadly. And we know that around 20% of African data is stored on the continent which is a concern for security and sovereignty, as was discussed earlier, and also a potential constraint on speed. And I'd like to go around um, our panelists again, and I will ask um, if you can please try and keep your answers to a minute or so, just being conscious of um, time, as we've got a lot to cover today. So Ismail, I'd like to turn to you first, with Morocco being one example of many countries that have passed data sovereignty regulations. And I'd love to understand more from you, especially coming um, with a company that responds to government calls for bits. How does digital independence affect Sherry? Sorry, Ismail, no, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, so like in Ivory Coast, in Morocco, we also have uh, many laws that have been passed for data sovereignty. And uh, when you are a ministry, you have to make sure that your data is based in Morocco. So uh, public sector uh, do a lot of bid for tender to get services from local players. Let's take an example. When they want uh, to have a, a mailing platform to start sending mailings, they, 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 they look for local players. But unfortunately, we can't find players that are working well on the deliverability to make sure that the email sent would be received by the by 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 people. So they ended up uh, <laughs> finding other solutions. And let me give a, a real example. Uh, some ministries in Morocco got fed up uh, using local uh, emailing tools, so decided to use Gmail, which is Google Workforce, right? Work workspace. Uh, and asked companies in Morocco to do for them a duplication of the data. So the ministries are having their emails on Google, but in order to comply with local laws, they ask other companies to duplicate the emails so they are at the same time in Morocco and 
outside Morocco. So just to conclude, if you want to be fully independent and have your full sovereignty, not only you will have to have your data centers in your own country, but at the same time, you will have to develop tools and softwares in order to use whatever uh, services you need. Uh, and I believe that it's complicated to compete with big players such as Google or Amazon, and it's not tomorrow that we will be able to do the same service as them. So full sovereignty, I'm not sure we will be able to reach it. Thank you, Ismail. Interesting themes there as well. On the other, other side of the coin, Munir, I'd like to turn to you next. As at Huawei, you're working on this and especially looking at sovereign cloud and helping governments set up data centers to host sensitive data locally. What are you seeing are positive changes in terms of digital independence? And what do you think has room to improve? Um, going back just to previous comments um, and the definitions uh, about law and uh, sovereignty and cloud. Uh, uh, at Hawaii, we don't see um, cloud as one cloud. It's very, very important, this definition. Um, as Ismail just mentioned now, the public sector and uh, the citizen services is uh, really what we define at Hawaii as sovereign cloud. It should be monitored, it should be regulated, it should be under the country and the national law. This is extremely important. We cannot afford having citizen data, medical data hosted elsewhere. This is very confidential sensitive data, customs, taxes, healthcare, citizen records should not be hosted. And the government needs to have this limitation, this law, this regulation to control their citizens' data in country. And this is what we define as a sovereign cloud within Hawaii. We cannot be and host any government data in hyperscale mode in a public cloud without local regulation. And if I step back and go in beyond Africa, I just watch and hear what happened in the European Union. And this is what where we they started beginning of last year, the Gaia X project. The Gaia X project is all about a project to have a European cloud provider to align and respect the local European laws. Okay. So this is very important. And this is where government like, and I'm happy to, to, to see uh, His Excellency, Mr. Uh, Mr. Roger Adam being part of the panelists, Ivory Coast and other countries in the region are having this top urgent matter on their digital agenda. And they are pushing to build sovereign cloud data centers, the Anvis, uh, 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 very heavily into that because this is about African future and African digital future. Okay, tomorrow you have your data, your tax, your banking records hosting somewhere else. How can you uh, uh, run away from foreigner laws and, and regulations? Okay, so this is one 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 point very important we are seeing. You also talked about uh, uh, innovation, innovation and investment. Innovation and investment and R&D, and I'm happy to see here that government also needs to, to, to give a push to the startup ecosystem, okay? What we've seen in 2021 is a good indicator, okay? From, from investment in the startup, digital startup ecosystem going from two billion something dollar uh, uh, in 2020 uh, it's two times and more uh, reaching around 4.3 4.4 4 
billion dollar in the uh, startup ecosystem, the digital startup ecosystem, which is a very, very good, good sign. But this needs to be supported by government and for structure investment into the African countries. So to boost innovation and push the startup ecosystem to create a, 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 a unicorn, African unicorn going uh, 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 worldwide into Africa. Last but not the least, last but not the least, uh, something that we did not talk about and I want to bring it here. It's also about talent, okay? It's about talent. And we at Hawaii, we have ICT Academy uh, 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 and we boost the certification and the education in, in, in partnership with education government, African education government, to train and certify the new generation, the new engineer, the new technician uh, around cloud, AI, and new technology and 5G. So those talent will be a handicap if we do not bring our ta African talent expertise to the required level, okay? So those are our are, are challenges that I see and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and come in. Uh, and our government, our African government needs uh, uh, to look at it at the top uh, of their digital agenda. Thank you. I'd like to continue on that theme on what can the government do in terms of the overall ecosystem. And Patrice, I'd like to turn to you um, and then I'll turn to you as well from play on this. Paul Francois earlier talked about the ACFTA, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, earlier as a key tool for governments to capitalize on. Can you tell us more about how creating a single digital market will impact the data center ecosystem? Thank you. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the subject is a very, the topic is interesting uh, on uh, us African um, data center player we 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 would like to see i mean more action um into that to i mean first of all to help i mean african to have their to own i would say the their digital economy so these are actions that will as a i mean a, a actor of the data center these are actions that will develop i mean the the markets because you have more uh, more players, more actors that will be that, that will collaborate. Okay, we'll have uh, more investors that will we trust. I mean the market, and so all this will develop. I think will develop. I mean the the, the market of uh, Africa data center. Uh, so we, for instance, we have um, we 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 have customers. Okay, we have customers who would like to launch a new business but sometimes we are you know uh, we face difficulty because of uh regulatory we are not uh in place okay so one of the things uh, that i think uh, i think is good to do uh, talking about that, that free trade area is not that it's true that government and national government make action but collective action will will accelerate things this is what i believe so for me like government can bring or adopt like the uh, regulatory uh, best practice uh, wherever is possible, for instance, uh, in order to, to, to help, you know, a new business uh, to easily get into uh, the, the market. Um, like, uh, uh, let's take an example of uh, a, 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 telecom, a telecom company Okay, who we'll face a lot of obstacle to, to roll out their business because of lack of uh, uh, regulatory best practice. Definitely, uh, this aid will affect uh, the business for the players in, in the market. So this is what I can tell. Thank you, Patrice. Funke, I'll turn to you next on what can African governments do to strengthen the ecosystem, particularly from the perspective of private data center operators? Well, um, I think I'll start from the digital independence um, standpoint. And I, 
believe digital independence and data sovereignty is going to become more important and more important to our governments as um, Africa continues to digitally transform. And so what do governments need to do? If we pull together some of what has been said on this platform, the issue of startups um, going on global platforms, the economies of scale and the competitiveness that those platforms bring um, suggest that one of the things we need to do is build scale, because it's only when you have that scale and competence and the world-class standards in Africa that those data centers are going to compete. So um, incentives, um, are of different kinds, while the incentives might not be in form of usage credits, it could be in terms of other incentives for startups um, to build an ecosystem and host locally um, that are available from government tax incentives or other kinds of business credits that really enable the ecosystem to grow. Um, and the infrastructure base to grow because that is fundamentally sound for all Africans. It was also encouraging to hear the minister um, speak about um, data sovereignty and data residency, not just in Cote d'Ivoire, but in the ECOWAS block. I think the regional blocks and one based on geographic proximity as well, as well as higher degree of um, economic activity across those land borders uh, make a good present a good opportunity um, for data center players um, to deliver services across borders, um, especially when some of the regulations in the across those countries are harmonized. So I think you know harmonization of regulations, um, incentives to encourage scale. Um, I, I think just as Paul Francois said at the beginning, um, at this stage, it's really not an issue of ownership. I would put building scale where the scale is governed by local laws and regulations and also operated by nationals. So you're starting to see more of that data value chain come into Africa, um, create opportunity, create jobs, help develop scale, um, and, and make services available uh, that are of higher quality and more cost effective to African consumers. And I, I really think those are the things the government can do. Of course, we also have the fundamental things like um, improved power availability for the grid, for, for the grid, and lowering of input taxes to deploy digital infrastructure. So uh, the, the taxes should be on the productive output rather than actually creating that infrastructure. And if we can have some of these measures and we could accelerate the rate of deployment and the benefits that would be derived by African consumers. Thank you, Funke. Really interesting themes around thinking across borders in terms of regulations, in terms of service offerings. I'd like to move on um, next to talk about cloud services more specifically. And I think we have a lot of our poll results coming up um, as we move to that as well. So interesting, so big themes around electricity, connectivity, as we were discussing earlier. Some of the themes we've discussed around talent regulations, cross-country coordination, also important, but less kind of um, coming up, less highest constraints here. Interesting, thank you all for participating in that. So looking more specifically at cloud services, as Paul Fonsor introduced, they're designed to provide easy, affordable access to applications, resources, services, without needing the user to manage their own digital infrastructure. The use of this is, of course, already widespread, especially with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we see quite big numbers and exciting numbers in terms of the potential implications for innovators in Africa. So for example, from Deloitte, looking at a six country study at cloud technology helping SMEs to grow 26% faster and deliver 21% higher gross profits. I'd like to come to a theme around the link between cloud computing and innovation for African startups and how we capitalize on that. So I'll come to you on this Ismail and then to you Patrice. 
So Ismail, can you talk to us about how cloud solutions are allowing Shari to disrupt the FMCG fast moving consumer goods industry and to access cutting edge technologies that can help you towards success? Yes. Thank you, Anna. Okay. Of course. So, as many startups here in Africa, we are trying to uh, disrupt the way uh, things are uh, things are currently done. In the example of Sherry, basically, we are in a mobile app that uh, is provided to local shop owners, so they can order anything they want and get delivered in less than twenty four hours. So, when you are a small boutique or epicerie, and before you had to shut down your store and go to the next supermarket to buy your procurement, you don't need to do that anymore because with the app, you can get everything in less than 24 hours. Before, that wouldn't have been possible without cloud computing. Why? Because we need to have a real view on our data and know exactly what is existing on our stock so the guys can order something that is available. So when before we had to use some technology that was not available to us because mainly too expensive. Again, thanks to uh, the, the cloud computing, what I was saying before about the fact that we can rent, we can rent on a pay as you go basis, uh, servers with the high capacity of calculation. When today we can use great softwares uh, such as ERPs that before were very expensive and used only by big companies. Today, a startup can buy one license from uh, SAP and start using uh, tools that were before not open to, to, to it. So again, today, a company like Sherry is able to provide real-time data to its users and a great service because we are today hosted by Amazon, Microsoft, Google on servers that are able to give us data on a quick way and again, in a cheap way. So cloud computing is enabling local startups to disrupt many industries. And we will keep seeing in the coming months and years, African startups raising money from international venture capitalists so they can use this money to invest in infrastructure services uh, softwares and disrupt the way things are done in africa thank you Ismail. great to hear um your perspective as a i guess as a customer for these services and on the side of a service provider patrice i'd love to hear from you in terms of are there examples you'd like to talk to from your experience in terms of the benefits of cloud services for startups? Hello, Annette, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ismail, for, for what you added just now. Uh, in fact, for the experience, what I can I can tell is, uh, is that you all know, um, cloud computing is, is very uh, um, efficient more than the traditional technology infrastructure that we know and for startup who are very lean uh, organization there the, the are certain things that they cannot afford for for their business to to, to be able to launch ishmael, ishmael gave some examples that are very clear so they have uh, pay as you go pay as you go as well that are available on cloud computing that they cannot find in uh, traditional uh, infrastructure technology. So from the experience, uh, because we are running, um, we are hosting a customer and we can see that some most, some of them and mostly the startup, uh, what they want is just uh, some time to set up some infrastructure just to be able to, to have some, some proof of concept to show to investors. Okay, so they cannot afford investing in huge, I mean, uh, infrastructure just to try something or just to show that their solution is, is working. So I, I finally, I can tell you that it is very efficient for, for startup to, to take advantages of, of all that the cloud computing 
is providing. Today, we have services like infrastructure as a service and in everything as a service is available for the startup to be able to you know, quickly set up their business and start running. So this is one of the big advantages that you know, uh, uh, cloud computing will bring to, I mean, to startup. It will reduce also uh, their risk of entrepreneurship. So that's the example I gave you. They can quickly, uh, they have the flexibility with the uh, cloud infrastructure to scale up and down and scale down, you know, uh, whatever they want to try in, in terms of infrastructure. Okay, so there's a cost saving behind all this that is not, uh, that is, is good to, to mention. Thank you, Patrice. I want to return to a topic that we've touched on a couple of times around competing with the likes of Amazon, Google, or Microsoft international players. And Funke, I'd like to turn to you on this one, especially as, as a cloud solutions provider, you work with startups as part of your client base. And do you see these international players like Google and Amazon as your competitors, or do you see your services as complementary or somewhere in between? The other question I'd like to ask along with that is, does a startup's growth stage or the size of a business more generally, how does that affect its choice of provider? Okay, no, thank you. We do not see the international players as competition at all. Um, and, you know, the, the realities are the local solutions as we start gaining critical mass are best suited to those large, either large enterprise businesses or businesses that have a requirement at the onset for that data residency. Otherwise, there are lots of complementary solutions, including some that we offer that allow people to host their data, the critical sensitive data, store that locally um, while we're integrating them into some of these global platforms. Um, for others who do not have those requirements, and certainly there are lots of areas where African consumers are consuming um, products, be it content, entertainment, movies, music um, from these global platforms, we are actually partners or providers to those global companies and enabling them deliver services into the region. Ultimately, as the population, user population for these platforms grow, we're also hosting um, a good number of those global players already in Africa and in our data centers, as well as in others. And we're seeing that presence continue to grow. So we don't see them as competition at all, but very complementary and helping to grow the overall ecosystem and the availability of solutions to African startups um, who truly need that advantage to compete on a global basis. And our integration into those the global platforms then give African content um, platforms like Iroko TV or other players access to consumers on a global basis. And so that's a that's value um, that we think is essential that we bring and that we continue to grow. And as that critical mass um, develops, then the, the, the price differentiation, I think, is lessened because the local platforms can be as competitive. And I think that's what drives startups. So I would say for startups, um, certainly going the route of um, affordable and very pocket friendly with a lot of freebies um, is typically what they require to prove the business model works. And then as they start getting paying consumers um, who care about performance and latency and some of these other things, then migrating uh, their platforms onto local, local, into local data centers becomes more critical. But first is survive. Um, thrive, grow, grow some critical mass, and then perhaps performance comes into play in terms of reducing latency and proximity to the eyeballs that they're serving, and you start seeing them migrating back onto the continent. Great. Thank you so much, Funke. Great. From there, I'd like to turn to some of the questions from the audience, and I'd like to thank you all both for all the connections in the chat, but also 
for some of the really interesting questions you shared over the course of this webinar. So Funky was just talking earlier around considerations for competing or complementary data services from the perspective of startups. And one question we had from Wabri Omar is, how can digital services companies and not just startups cooperate with private data centers in Africa while still offering, offering competitive services? So kind of extending our discussion beyond startups. And Munir, I'd like to um, turn to you briefly um, on that question. Yeah, um, thank you, Annette, for uh, the question. And uh, again, so going going in the same same trend and logic that uh, Fanky just described, that uh, 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 there are there are different clouds. Uh, I, I I I as I mentioned before, and for a startup ecosystem, yes, uh, maybe looking at the cost, maybe looking at uh, 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 at being agile, like being because no, not that critical or secure data, okay. But growing the business and going beyond that basic needs, okay, will require uh, uh, more alignment, more governance on the data, on the laws and the regulation uh, 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 locally, okay. So uh, this is where we see. You've mentioned a couple of uh, cloud providers, and we are one of them. Huawei Cloud is also available in Africa. Uh, but when it comes to clouds in countries helping critical citizen uh, 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 needs, uh, we do prefer building those in partnership and in respect of the regulations and law of the countries, OK? And this is where uh, uh, the dilemma here is that, uh, is it just a B2C non-critical then can be, and we are one of those players, uh, but when it comes to more secure, more government, more national data services, uh, touching the citizens, African citizens and and uh, uh, in respect and governments of the local laws and the regulation, then a, a different uh, uh, approach is is uh, is required. Thank you very much, Munir. One thing that we've been discussing throughout this conversation on data centers is what are the benefits coming out and how do we look at building an ecosystem networks across on this. And one question we've had from Charles Gvanda, where I'd like to start with your thoughts, um, Ismail, on this, is that data is critical to fuel fast progress and targeted innovations, which is really important for the welfare of citizens. And the question is, how can African governments support collaboration between entities that own data and those that need to use data in the course of their work? Ismail, over to you um, on that question, particularly thinking about uh, Shari using data. Uh, so, sorry, Annette, I, I got cut during the question, so I didn't hear the, the last part. No problem. Um, so it's how can African governments support collaboration between entities that own data and those that need to use the data collected? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, so again, uh, the, the, the role of uh, uh, African government in general is to help uh, local startups be at the same, uh, have the same tools uh, and help than uh, other startups and foreign startups. Why? Because the, 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 the market is becoming more and more global and your competition is not anymore local competition, but global competition. So the services you are offering are today cross borders and you can from Africa start offering uh, cloud uh, services to people all around the world. Therefore, uh, again, uh, when you look at regulations that happen here, 
in Africa. Sometimes you are not even allowed from Africa to use uh, Western services because of the fact that you are not able to pay in, in currencies. Uh, North Africa, for instance, have office de change that uh, put a limit on, on, on what you can pay with foreign uh, currencies. That's the first point. The second point is that um, sometimes these big players find, I mean, those who are offering the, 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 the best services, uh, find out that Africa is for no a small market. So they don't even do the efforts of releasing a version that could work for a local uh, startups. So that's again, the role of the government to find ways to sign partnerships with these big players to attract them to our countries so we they can start offering their services which sometime, um, sub uh, with sometimes their activities subsidized by local government. So the, 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 the opportunity because becomes interesting for them to be here. Again, without an ecosystem of founding, of tools, of regulation, African startup will never raise on a global stage. And if we want to compete with those guys in the Silicon Valley, we obviously need the help from uh, local governments and cool and very nice ministers as the one we have today on stage. Absolutely, absolutely echoing that one as well. Thank you very much. I'm conscious that we're over time already because it's been such an interesting discussion um, that I very much wanted to continue. Um, I think we'll close and leave it there. Thank you so much to our panelists, to our guests, our expert today, and for our great attendees who've been so engaged. I hope we can carry on this conversation and keep connecting um, even after we um, close today. Just a final reminder um, to save the date for the Africa CEO Forum Annual Summit on the 13th to 14th of June this year in Abidjan. Thank you so much to all for joining this and for this really fascinating discussion and for your great questions. Wishing you all well. Take care and thank you so much again for joining today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.